What is going on, everyone? Hope you're having a great day. We've got a few news topics to get through concerning AMD RX Vega, Intel's upcoming Coffee Lake CPUs, as well as a huge Ethereum heist that just happened yesterday. So let's kick things off with AMD and RX Vega, who started their big tour that they're doing with this graphics card, which will lead up to the release at the end of the month in SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles. They started this off in Budapest, Hungary, where they invited out the press to come and see a demo of RX Vega behind closed doors, where they had the RX Vega graphics card inside of an AMD system, as well as a system with a GTX 1080, which was a Founders Edition card. So they ran this test where they had both systems kind of closed up where you couldn't see what was inside either system. So the press that were playing on these systems didn't know if they were using RX Vega or GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition. And they were both hooked up playing Battlefield 1 on 3440 by 1440 monitors, which were using FreeSync and G-Sync respectively for the different systems, although that wasn't clear to the press either which monitors they were using. They even had logos and everything like that covered up so you wouldn't know which monitor brand or anything like that you were using exactly. And the frame rate was being limited on both displays as well, presumably at 60 hertz because these monitors, I mean, these the RT, at least the GTX 1080, I should say, is not going to get, you know, 100 hertz, 100 FPS plus or whatever at ultra settings at that particular resolution. I recently did some benchmarks with the 1080 Ti and the GTX 1080 in ultra wide at 3440 by 1440. And uh, taking a look at those here, you can see that the 1080 ended up getting an average of 82 FPS, while the 1080 Ti got 107 FPS in Battlefield 1 on 64 player Amiens. So taking that into account, it should be able to hit at least 60 FPS, which is probably what the monitor was locked at for both cards. And uh, yeah, that doesn't really tell us a whole lot though about the performance because if it's you know, performing at the level of GTX 1080 or maybe slightly above, which we've talked about in the past with rumors and leaks that have come out about what RX Vega can do and also based on Frontier Edition performance, um, then it should be able to do 60 FPS at this resolution on that game without an issue if it's even t if it's even tying the GTX 1080, you know, even at the very least it should, it should be tying it um, in this particular title. And we don't know if it was DX11 or DX12, but uh, that's really all we got. It's just uh, behind closed doors testing sort of for the press, and they'll be continuing on with this event. The uh, next one is going to be at PDX Land on July 21st through July 23rd, and then finally it'll be at SIGGRAPH on July 30th. So not too much longer to go before we finally get to see these cards released out into the wild. Uh, next up, the original source of this story is actually Canard PC, which is a French hardware magazine and website, and they originally published this, but Video Cards did the uh, the hard work of translating this and sort of uh, you know boiling down all the information for us. So this rumor is saying that Intel's Coffee Lake will have a couple of six core CPU variants, and not just on the i7 where we would see six cores, twelve threads with hyper-threading, and according to the rumor, they are saying that it will have a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz and a TDP of 95 watts, which is down from the 140 watts on the 7800X recently released on the X299 platform. So that's going to be really interesting to see, and there will also be a non-K SKU, the i7-8700, which would have a base clock of 3.2 gigahertz. We don't know yet what turbo frequency will be on these and how far you'll be able to overclock them, we will just have to wait and see when uh, these eventually get released and we get the specs and all that officially from Intel. But the more interesting one that I, th I saw in here was the i5 variant, which is going to also have six cores according to the rumor. Obviously, no hyper-threading though because it's the i5 lineup and that's how Intel do. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a, you know, a response to Ryzen and Ryzen 5 and you know having the six cores, 12 threads out there. In the market, but I mean, if they're going to release this with just six cores, no hyper threading, then you know, I mean, they're still losing <laughs> to Ryzen, at least on thread count anyway. They may be faster in IPC and get higher clock speeds and all of that at the end of the day once we finally see these CPUs. But for you know, multi threaded workloads, I would still prefer to use something like the 1600 or 1600X that's going to give you the 12 threads. I use a 6800K in my main system here still right now. 
And uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate appreciate having the 12 threads for video rendering and streaming, all that good stuff. So yeah, I think as far as multi-threaded workloads are concerned, I think Intel is still going to kind of miss out on that crowd that are looking to get budget rendering and, you know, multi-threaded workload systems that are under $300. So I'm not really sure who these are going to be aimed at and who's going to go out and pick up these six cores when they could get, you know, pretty much double the threads for probably close to the same price or maybe even less with Ryzen. And our last news story is the big Ethereum heist over at Coindash. Just yesterday, Coindash launched an ICO or initial coin offering, which is a way of raising a lot of capital to invest in a form of cryptocurrency. In this case, it would have been Ethereum, where investors can go on and get their wallet address and then send in their Ethereum coins into a big pool for Coindash to use to invest on their behalf. So really what happened here is that it wasn't necessarily their wallet that got hacked. That would be very difficult to do because you usually get a very long 12-word passphrase of just random words that you would need if you ever wanted to mirror that wallet on another PC or mobile device of any kind. So that's rather difficult to hack. It would probably take a serious amount of power and time to brute force something like that. So uh, they didn't actually hack their wallet. What they did was they hacked the website because the website had just published the Ethereum wallet address right on there. So these hackers broke into the website and changed the wallet address to their own wallet, which uh, was actually named Fake Coindash. <laughs> the wallet's name was Fake Coindash. Uh, over on Etherscan, they have um, transaction history for every transaction that was done on this particular uh, wallet here, and you can see that they raised up yesterday about 40, 43,488 Ether, which by today's value, uh, trading at $222 per Ether, is worth in the neighborhood of $9.7 million. So, yeah, someone over at Coindash kind of effed up. They, yeah, they just, they completely ignored, um, you know, warnings. People on Reddit had warned them about some of the security risks of doing something like this, which they you know, completely brushed off and just continued doing what they were doing anyway, and it ended up happening exactly like someone said it would, and someone changed the Ethereum wallet address on there, and now they are out a ton of money and probably have a lot of pissed off investors on their hands. So yeah, sorry Coindash, just uh, I guess next time listen to Reddit. <laughs> But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here, guys. Please let me know your thoughts on all of the news stories that we covered here today. I do look forward to your feedback as always. Don't forget to leave a like on the video down below if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you're not already. And if you have been here for a while, you can always hit the notification bell to find out whenever I'm uploading new tech news videos like this one. And I will catch you guys next time. Tara.